So welcome to the Australian launch of the World Report on Hearing. My name is Catherine McMahon and I'm a prof Professor of Audiology at Macquarie University and the Director of the HEAR Centre. Before we formally get started, I'd like to run through some housekeeping. Just to let you know, this is a COVID safe event and we've restricted the number of guests attending to allow for social distancing. Um, if you could uh, respect this and ensure you spread out in the allocated and marked seats. Uh, if there is an emergency, and we're certainly not expecting one, please leave the theatre in an orderly fashion uh, via the exits, and we have two here. Proceed to the fire, uh, fire stairs and exit the building. This event is being filmed and will be premiered on YouTube at 2 p.m. Um, can all of today's speakers ensure that they speak into the lectern uh, mic so that the audio is recorded clearly and also we've got the camera that we pointed directly at you. Thank you. Now, it is a pleasure to hand over to Zach Roberts to provide an acknowledgement of country, followed by David Brady, who will talk about the importance of hearing care for all. Thank you, Zach. Um, Walawani, everyone, hello. Uh, my name's Zach Roberts. I'm a PhD student here at Macquarie University, and I'm also a Ewan man from the South Coast communities of New South Wales. Um, Macquarie University is on the lands of the Watamatical people of the Darug Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past and present, and I'd like to um, pay particular attention to the continuity of knowledge that has nurtured this country and community, and extend my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with us here today. Thank you. Thank you uh, for welcoming the country back. And um, I'd like to acknowledge the many community elders and hearing care providers who are working together to address the unacceptable level of hearing health issue among our First Nations people. I'd like to thank you, the captioner and to the Auslan interpreter, uh, translating my voice and others into the national language of the Australian deaf community. Thank you to the Hearing Hub and Macquarie University for hosting the event today on behalf of our sector. Imagine a six-year-old child trying to learn to read when they can't hear the teacher. There are no interpreters, no sound field, and no captions available. A teenager trying to make new friends when they struggle to keep up with what the other kids are saying. A 30-year-old adult who is not eligible for the NDIS because they're not deaf enough is trying to find the $6,000 they need to hearing devices that allow them to get and keep a job. A worker is applying for a new job or promotion, constantly agonising over whether to put deaf in their application forms. At a family celebration, an older relative is relegated to the corner because the family assumes that their mind is going, when in really, they just can't hear. A person in an aged care home struggles to convince care workers with masks to change the batteries in their hearing devices, but they don't respond because they, might, they think they might have dementia. I am one of the one in six Australians with a hearing loss of some degree. There are almost four million of us, and yet it's such a paradox. It is so prevalent in the community. It has such a low level awareness and understanding it's frequently overlooked, neglected and forgotten. You know, hearing health goes beyond the ears. It encompasses well-being, quality of life, psychological factors, social functioning, intimate relationships, health, uh, sorry, education and employment. Every morning, I and millions of, of us often wake up with a sense of and anxiety when we switch on our hearing devices, hoping they will work well enough to get us through today's challenges. Communications, whether it's verbal or through signing, allow us to share information and knowledge and be active participants in life. Hearing loss is expensive. It's costing the Australian economy $15 billion a year and even more cost to our health system. Back in 2014, 
Deafness Forum rallied together 40 organisations representing consumers, service providers, academics and advocacy groups. We collaborated and created Break the Sound Barrier campaign, a movement to call on our government to make hearing health and wellbeing a national priority. Trent Zimmerman, the member for North Sydney, was listening. He persuaded the Prime Minister of the day to establish a parliamentary inquiry to hearing health and wellbeing of Australia. How did our sector respond? Well, 104 submissions were lodged, more than 50 witnesses gave evidence at many different, at about nine different locations across our great southern land. The result was a great report from a parliamentary inquiry. It empowering Minister Ken Wyatt to bring together representatives of our sector to debate, create and founded the roadmap for hearing health and wellbeing for Australia. For the first time in our history, our sector and all governments today and tomorrow have a true pathway with key priorities and necessary action to make real progress, to change lives and to open the conversation for all Australians to make, to ensure hearing care for all. Australian parliamentarians from both sides showed their hands by forming the Parliamentary Friends of Hearing, Health and Deafness, led by members of Parliament Dr Fiona Martin and Dr Mike Freelander. The Hearing Health Sector Alliance was formed. Also Deafness Forum in Australia, along with many other Australian organisations, many here today, uh, joined the World Hearing Forum, a program of a World Health Organisation. Today, we look forward to World Hearing Report. Looking back, we played a great first innings, but as all great cricketers know, the second inning <laughs> is the hardest to win. <laughs> Together, we have a responsibility not to allow the roadmap for hearing, health and wellbeing to gather dust on the shelves. For today, it's World Hearing Day, March 3rd, 2021. What is it I, as Chair of Deafness Forum, the CEO, of an organisation provide mentoring for young deaf people. And someone whose hearing loss is lifelong and very personal. What did I and millions of Australians like me want? Simply just to make hearing, health and wellbeing a national priority in Australia. So that we can have a conversation. So when it's real, we can position Australia's expertise to address the rising level of hearing loss globally and show the world on how it's done. So, onwards with the second innings. Thank you. <laughs> and on that, I'd like to um, introduce, um, well, actually, I will leave my crease, actually, to hand over to Trent Zimmerman, the Chair of the Parliament Standing Committee on Hearing, uh, Health, Aged Care and Sport to read a special message from the Australia's Prime Minister, Scott Morrison. After um, Mr Zimmerman, we'll also hear from Honourable Ju um, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister John Howard and also Minister Mark Coulton. Mr Zimmerman, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David, and thank you, everyone, for being here today on, uh, on such an important occasion. Um, I, too, want to start by acknowledging the Walla Medical people and paying my respects to Elders past and present and future. And in doing so, I think it's actually very important that we remember what probably disturbed me most about the parliamentary inquiry that we held into hearing health, and that is, uh, frankly, the scandalous levels of hearing health issues, the prevalence of otitis media in an Australian Indigenous communities, particularly in remote areas. Um, the worst, not just in the first world, but in many ways in the third world as well. And uh, I hope that continues to be a focus of all that we're trying to do. Um, it is great to be here with you today at this extraordinarily fantastic centre. And as Minister Tudge referred to, I think last week, uh, really a template, a flagship for the collaboration that uh, can and we hope to see more of existing between the university sector and the commercial world. And I want to congratulate everyone that uh, has 
provided the provision to keep this going in the way that it has so successfully. Um, I also want to thank Cochlear for once again for World Hearing Day, organising a wonderful festival and parade in Sydney this Saturday night to celebrate World Hearing Day. Um, but, uh, but it is an important occasion and my job today is to read a message from the Prime Minister. Um, I quipped with my staff this morning that that makes me Prime Minister for the next 30 seconds, so I'm pleased to announce an extra $3 billion. No, nope, sorry, that's not in the message. <laughs> But I will read the message from Scott Morrison. Uh, thank you for the invitation to join you on World Hearing Day to launch the World Report on Hearing. While I'm unable to be there with you, I'm delighted to send this message of support and congratulations to all involved. The Australian Government stands with you in a collective effort to address the challenges of hearing loss. Our roadmap to hearing health demonstrates the collaborative approach we need to provide innovative solutions. With an estimated 3.95 million Australians living with hearing loss, this is a national problem. But as my friend and mentor, former Prime Minister John Howard knows only too well, it is also a deeply personal experience. His insight into the impact of hearing loss was shaped in his youth and honed during his rise to Australia's highest political office. His resilience, perseverance and conviction are a lesson to us all. John Howard's experience of hearing loss influences admiration for Australians as innovators when it comes to responding to public health. That is the nature of the work undertaken by the organisations at today's launch. Your practical knowledge and leadership in the field of ear health is invaluable in preventing, treating and destigmatising hearing loss and damage. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, Australians have shown themselves to be strong and resilient. We are navigating the pandemic in a very Australian way. As a nation of remarkable cohesion, our strength lies in our love and care for each other. These values are the heart of our approach to health care and prevention, stronger, safer, together. Whether it's a hearing impaired child receiving early intervention or an older person benefiting from a hearing aid, we're working to ensure that no one is left behind. On World Hearing Day 2021, I welcome the focus on hearing loss prevention and a continuing commitment to world-class hearing care for all Australians. Signed by the Honourable Scott Morrison, Prime Minister of Australia. So thank you again for all that each and every one of you are doing to support those with hearing loss in the Australian community and your participation in this report that's being released today, which will have uh, such a, what I hope will be a profound impact. Uh, so um, let's celebrate all we've achieved, but never, less, uh, let, never forget what lies ahead of us. And happy Mardi Gras. <laughs>
is so important to the enjoyment of life and all the steps that can be taken to enhance the simple pleasure of hearing and conversing with those you love and those you associate with is something that ought to be at the very forefront of the policy objectives of governments around the world. So I commend the efforts of those not only in my own country, Australia, but around the world who are trying to develop coherent, effective, targeted policies to address hearing loss and to help those who need assistance in this area. Thank you. World Hearing Day is not just an opportunity to raise community awareness of hearing loss and hearing health care. It's also an appropriate time to reflect on what we in government and in the community are doing in relation to hearing health equality and to discuss future directions. This year, I think you'll agree, we have a lot to discuss and good reason to be optimistic, particularly because of the very close cooperation we now have between the hearing health sector researchers and governments at all levels. A major reflection of this collaboration was of course the Roadmap for Hearing Health. I consider the Roadmap an historic advance. The actions it proposed cover short, medium and long term and the whole sector, community groups, providers, manufacturers and researchers. I'm very proud of the $21.2 million investment to implement key initiatives from the Roadmap announced in the 2020 federal budget. $5 million will go for a national hearing health awareness and prevention campaign. $7.3 million for a competitive research grants program to improve our interventions for vulnerable people. $5 million for early identification of hearing and speech difficulties in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. $2 million for pilot measures supporting aged care residents with hearing loss. $200,000 for a hearing workforce audit and summit. And $400,000 to develop standards for teleaudiology using IT to make services more accessible. The national awareness campaign, I believe, is particularly important because it will lift the effectiveness of many other measures. As many of you know, I have hearing device. My ears were damaged by industrial noise. So I know how important it is to seek assistance early, whatever the person's age. But all too often, this doesn't happen because the affected person doesn't want to admit there's a problem. They're worried about how people will react. They don't want to be treated differently because they have a hearing aid. In 2021, hearing technology is getting better and better, but it's no help if people don't get the proper diagnosis, get the right device and use it. We're determined to ensure that modern hearing devices are available to those who need them. That's why I have ordered a review of the Government's Hearing Services Program. The HSP is a great program. Few countries have anything as good. But it can be even better and I'll get the report in July. Today I'd also like to welcome the release of the World Health Organization's first World Report on Hearing. The report establishes links between reducing hearing loss and achieving goals for ending poverty, creating healthier lives and improving education and jobs. Every Australian with hearing loss deserves to be able to communicate well and reach their potential in education and employment, to be socially connected, not isolated and be emotionally and mentally strong. I'd like to take this chance to thank all the organisations and individuals who are working constructively with the government to reach that goal and everyone taking part in this event. Thank you very much.
I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to elders past, present and future. It is um, a true pleasure to be here today. Today I'm standing before you to provide the key messages of the first ever World Report on Hearing prepared by the United Nations World Health Organization. The report is the result of almost three years of work, uh, for, which is uh, from experts drawn from many continents and it represents low, middle and high income countries. It's been a true privilege to contribute to this landmark report. My role is to summarise it in the next five minutes and to highlight what it means within an Australian context. So simply put, the World Report on Hearing calls for one key point of action and provides targets for all countries to meet. The key action is for all governments to integrate people-centred ear and hearing care into national health plans for universal health coverage. This recognises hearing as fundamental to good physical and mental health across the life course from babies through to the elderly. The targets are for countries to scale up efforts for early detection of hearing loss and middle ear disease uh, through screening programs in three populations, newborns, school-aged children, five to nine years of age, and adults. The target is a 20% scale up to 2030. So what does this mean for Australia? Well, in terms of newborn hearing screening, Australia is a recognised world leader in this space. As well as our leadership in service delivery, we've pro provided the most compelling evidence for the effectiveness of early detection of hearing loss on childhood development. For adults with hearing difficulties, we are probably on par with other high income countries. So one in four out, um, older adults with hearing loss will seek help. Yet hearing loss in midlife is the single largest potentially modifiable risk factor for dementia in later life. <coughs> There are still opportunities for us to improve the care of adults and outcomes, so we can do better. The third target is to scale up preschool and or school screening programs. This is to enable early detection for chronic malaria disease and unaddressed hearing loss in school-aged children. I would like to shift our attention here to middle ear disease because as the Honourable Trent Zimmerman noted, herein lies one of Australia's biggest challenges. In Australia, middle ear disease is more severe and lasts longer in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children than it does in non-Indigenous children. But crucially, it occurs earlier, and in fact, it can occur from six months of age, even for those children living in urban areas. The prevalence of middle ear disease in remote communities can be as high as 90%. 90%. It is at best comparable to low income countries, countries that lack infrastructure and resourcing. So in Australia, while preschool and school screening programs might detect hearing loss in school aged children that was not picked up previously, very important, this may not be the best or the only solution to the fundamental and enduring problem of chronic otitis media in Aboriginal children. Certainly our goal in Australia must be to detect and treat ear disease and hearing loss as early as possible to reduce long-term disadvantage and poorer life outcomes. Today's launch provides a global platform to unite and bring national and global policymaker attention to the importance of detecting ear disease and hearing loss early and connecting those in need to comprehensive care. The launch is supported by many organisations which represent different parts of solutions to hearing healthcare challenges. I'm going to provide just a few examples, of course there are many, uh, because of Australia's leadership within the area of ear and hearing health. Um, an example is the Centre for Research Excellence in Ear and Hearing Health of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children has provided the most up-to-date evidence-based guidelines for middle ear disease. In fact, this was published on Monday in the Medical Journal of Australia. Cochlear, who turns 40 this year, provides world-leading implantable solutions and is an iconic brand nationally and globally. And Hearing Australia and the National Acoustic Laboratories combined provide the world's most enviable and research-informed hearing services for children up to the age of 26. So with all of this goodwill and expertise, where's the gap? It brings us back to the primary recommendation of the World Report on Hearing. Today, the World Health Organization is declaring that hearing loss is a major 
public health problem and they're explicitly asking for hearing to be made part of national health plans. Hearing is not tangential, hearing is fundamental to health and wellbeing. We're incredibly fortunate in Australia that we've had people championing the cause, as David mentioned earlier. Action and interest from a local level is an impetus for action at a federal level, and we thank everybody for the, um, the action that we've had to date. But a crucial part of the interest is to convert it into true action that transforms lives. And bridging the gap is the opportunity that we have today. What is even more exciting than launching the World Report on Hearing is actually the next tranche of work, as has been mentioned, where we, can, we have a shared mission and purpose that has been formed from the, the launch of the World Report on Hearing. Thank you. It is my real pleasure now to introduce Associate Professor Kelvin Kong. Kelvin is from the Warramai people of Port Stephens. Uh, he qualified as the first Aboriginal Fellow of the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons and is now practicing in a Wabakal country in Newcastle. Kelvin was described in the, Lancet Commission, uh, in the Lancet recently as a trailblazer in Indigenous health in Australia and is well known for his leadership in the area. Thank you, Kelvin. Kuchiku. I just want to see if you can translate. Hello, my language. <laughs> um, uh, welcome, everyone, and I want to uh, also pay my respects uh, to the Darug Nation and to Zach, um, PhD candidate. Big respect. That's so good to see, and thanks for coming along and, and welcoming us to you today. Um, it's also important for me as a Warramai man to acknowledge that um, there's a lot of people online who will be listening to this, so pay my respects to the lands and the seas of all the countries that we're going across today. Um, what a big day for us, and I really hope we get some exposure looking at some of this stuff. Um, I want to peel back a little bit from what's been said this morning and actually come back to some of the realities of what we're talking about in the space that I work in, and that is the lives that are affected by this. And it's wonderful, and I'm really proud that I'm involved in uh, implant surgery and a lot of other kind of interventions, but we've got to come back to basic human rights and hearing as a human right. And there are two examples I want to share with you to try and illustrate that. The first is a common presentation, phone call that I get from all over Australia. And it's a presentation of a middle-aged Aboriginal person with complications of otitis media, or complications of ear disease. Now, otitis media is just an infection of the ear. Complications of otitis media range from abscess, pus, small hole, no eardrum, brain abscess, death. And the reality of that is that even last year, and more recently this last month, I was contacted about a death in custody. A death in custody from a gentleman who passed away from a complication of otitis media in Australia, a first world nation. So when you tease out some of the history associated with that, is that why is this middle-aged person getting a complication of otitis media? And let's look back at and reflect on some of the lifestyle that he endured growing up. The fact that he was incarcerated the fact he was incarcerated on multiple occasions, the fact he was socially isolated. And when you look back at the history, from a very, very early age, ear disease started. Discharging ears, perforations, infections, and all of this culminated to a lack of education. That lack of education then led to him wandering, and that's where he met the juvenile justice system and bounced in and out. Disharmony with social relationships, disengagement with his own children, not being able to enjoy this thing called life. And it's an absolute travesty that we're actually enduring this. And I say this all the time when I talk, that even if you hate Aboriginal health, the fact that we pour so much money into the other end of things, that we're actually ruining someone's life if we spend a lot more time in the public health arena, we can actually correct a lot of this. Which takes me to my second story. A two-year-old girl presenting with two words, not speaking much at all falling over, balance is dreadful, not engaging with her brother or sister because she couldn't actually engage properly. And they actually isolated her because she wasn't talking, because she wasn't playing, because she couldn't keep up on the playground. Even the fact that her younger sister was starting to meet some of her milestones at a younger age was quite hard. The wonderful thing, we met at two years of age. 
grommets are inserted or little tubes so they get the fluid out of the ears and the dramatic improvement within the first month after surgical intervention was incredible just by removing that fluid into the Aboriginal girl. Within two months, she was engaging with the conversation with the kids. Within that two month period, she was playing, running, dancing, and most importantly, singing along with the other kids in the classroom. The wonderful thing about this little Aboriginal kid is that was my daughter. And it was devastating to see for me, as a war on my man, that this disease doesn't affect um, the whole population, but seems to have catastrophic events. Now, I hope that I've changed that forever because she's now able to engage and that four now she runs amok, which is another story. <laughs> but the wonderful part of that is that what if we could actually change some of these and you look at all the people who are affected by the injustice, the incarceration, the lack of employment, the poor education, and all these things, and we talk about that. And the one frustrating part I get with all this is that I'm always presented with a complication of otitis media. Never ever am I talked about and said, there is a complication of otitis media which has actually wrecked this person's life. And that's the reality of it. It's not a medical condition, it's not an operation, it's wrecking someone's life. So I hope on World Hearing Day that we all can band together and really push this, that hearing is a human right for everyone and we need to do whatever we can to make sure that we ensure equity in this country. Thank you. <laughs>
and tackling indigenous smoking. And because that's one area that people don't realise, uh, that a smoker um, uh, is, is somebody who will have uh, an issue with hearing uh, or potentially an issue with hearing uh, later in life. So those relationships, those environmental relationships are so important. But let's celebrate today, celebrate World Hearing Day 2021 and celebrate the great World Report on Hearing uh, that's just been released and all the best for the day. Thank you. Thank you to Professor Kalmar. I'd now like to introduce Sue Walters. And Sue is the pres president of Cicada Australia Incorporated. Uh, she enjoys advocating for the cochlear implant and running social gatherings for recipients. Sue works at the Royal Institute for Deaf and Blind Children Cochlear Implant Program in clinical support and educating clients about their cochlear implant equipment. Thank you, Sue. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today and I'd like to pay my respects also to the Darug Nation and to all of you who are champions for the cause. Um, so in 1984 was a big year for me. Um, I was studying traditional Chinese medicine and uh, working, having a big social life with friends. Uh, then I got, in April, meningococcal meningitis. I was unconscious for four days and when I woke up I couldn't walk or see or hear anything except this loud ringing in my ears. So my life as I'd known it just sort of stopped. Four months later I was offered a cochlear implant and a chance to hear. I wasn't really sure at first because I didn't really know much about it. Um, but in the end I thought, oh well, you know, I'll give it a try. <laughs> so. September that year, I was switched on to sound again. And it was a funny sort of sound at first, but I quickly realised that um, this was connecting me to the real world and I could hear my voice again and the sounds around me. So it was amazing too to be a part of this pioneering program. Lots of people wanted to know about the implant and I became like the accidental advocate. <laughs> I was able to tell people firsthand what it was like to hear with an implant, all that experience. And it was amazing to be working with a team of people who were just like breaking new ground with this technology. Like their integrity and enthusiasm was just so inspiring. And I was glad to be able to contribute in any way that I could. We started a little support and advisory group. Um, and Bill Gibson came up with the name Cicada because it stands for Cochlear Implant Club and cicadas make a lot of noise. So I'm forever grateful to Professor Graham Clark for his dream and his courage to sort of push on against all the adversity. I'm also grateful um, to Professor Bill and Alex Gibson who brought heart and soul to this and they also brought good people together to build the Sydney Cochlear Implant Program and make it a centre of excellence and to make that implant available to all. So I'm also grateful to Cochlear who keep us hearing now and always. <laughs> uh, so I've come a long way uh, thanks to the efforts of many people uh, who supported and mentored me. You never get your old life back, it's like you keep creating a new one. Uh, there's still challenges uh, in many situations. Uh, even walking in a straight line, uh, I have to pay attention. <laughs> but I've come to realise that life will keep challenging you on all levels. So with all the advances in sound processes, the technology, my hearing keeps getting better as I get older. Uh, even after 36 years of hearing with this device, seeing so many people switched on, talking to and meeting implant recipients all over the world, I still think this is an absolute miracle. And uh, so I would like to advocate <laughs> hearing care for all. <laughs>
Thank you. Thanks, Sue. Uh, we next have Justin Langer, an Australian the Australian cricket coach and ambassador for the Ear Science Institute of Australia. Unfortunately, he couldn't be with us today, but he has provided us with a video message of support uh, for the day and to talk to us about hearing care for all. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Justin Langer here. It's an honour to be involved in this year's World Hearing Day as the ambassador for Ear Science Institute Australia, a World Health Organisation collaborating centre. Our mission is to help open up the conversation about hearing. You are never too young or too old to take the first step towards healthy hearing. I know firsthand the importance of early intervention and receiving treatment after suffering from my own ear and hearing disorder over the last 18 months. Having suffered from vertigo, vestibular migraines and tinnitus, I'm so thankful that we have so many extraordinary treatment opportunities here in Australia. It's great to see the steps being taken in the hearing sector, especially the Australian launch of the World Health Organisation World Report on Hearing. Today is about hearing care for all. Thank you so much and I wish you all a happy and healthy World Hearing Day. Thank you to Justin. Now for the fun part. So can I invite Brett Lee up to the stand? And oh, here we go. Let's uh, make sure this works. There we go for you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I'm sure that Brett needs no introduction, but I'll introduce him anyway. A true Australian cricket and sporting legend. However, in this capacity, he's here with us today um, as a passionate advocator for hearing healthcare. He's a World Health Organization World Hearing Forum champion. Um, so uh, today, Brett, you're a very well-known TV sports commentator, and so I feel bad about doing this, but if you don't mind, I'm going to turn the table and ask you the questions. Done. Fantastic. Um, so I'm going to start with the first question. Um, why is the WHO's World Report on Hearing uh, message of hearing care for all so important to you? Well, and firstly, uh, good afternoon. I think it's, uh, well, good morning still, everyone, uh, and to all the VIPs that are here today. You know, for me personally, it's it's an opportunity to be able to put back in. Um, I've been very grateful. I've grown up in a, a normal family with normal eyesight, normal hearing. And to think about so many young children, not only here in Australia, but around the world that are suffering some form of hearing loss, we had to do something about it. So from all the reports that I've read, from all of the information uh, that has been, I guess, given to me, this is a time now where we have to make a change. Mm. And personally, uh, you know, a lot of people will wonder why I got involved in, um, I guess, being an advocate for hearing loss. My son, when he was uh, quite young, about four or five years of age, he had a fall, like a pretty bad accident. Uh, I was over in India. I got the phone call to say that he had fractured his skull and he was bleeding from his right ear. And as anyone that um, obviously has been involved with uh, some type of head trauma, as a parent, you know, you're very scared. Pretty much eventually what happened was he uh, lost his hearing or most of his hearing in his right ear. Uh, I didn't know what to expect and I kept getting on Google and I was, I was Googling hearing loss in children. And every time I'd Google hearing loss, cochlear kept coming up. And it was cochlear and Google again, cochlear and seeing all the wonderful work that they have done. Anyway, a long, long story short, he had what I was told from the surgeon, a compressed nerve. His hearing came back naturally without any intervention, which he's one of the lucky ones. And then I thought, well, this might be an opportunity for me now to, you know, the easy option was to go down that sporting road mm -hmm. and help kids with cricket, which is very important as well. Uh, but this was very close to my heart. So I thought that I wanted to, to be able to help children, um, certainly here in Australia and, you know, around the world to be able to be able to hear again, because having my son change where he sat in the classroom and have to put his left ear forward and, you know, his schoolwork suffered in terms of when he went to, to kindergarten and preschool. He, he's, that suffered for a little bit. But then when his hearing came back naturally and, um, you know, had the opportunity to, to repair itself, I thought he's one of the lucky ones, but so many children aren't. Yeah, thank you. Uh, a, a very clear personal experience with mm. um, hearing problems. 
Um, just onto the World Report on Hearing. So the World Report on Hearing reminds us that there's a rising prevalence of hearing loss, and a lot of that is driven by the ageing population. There's a lot that's being done in Australia for younger children, um, but there seems to still be a lot more we could do for adults. Do you want to share your thoughts on this? Yeah, look, um, I, I guess we, we always focus on children, which is very important because they're the next generation coming through, and they're the... the you know, the next prime ministers, the boys and girls, the next sporting stars. So we always focus on what they're doing. But the other thing I have noticed over the last probably five or six, seven years that I've been doing this in, on behalf of Cochlear is that there are so many um, older people around Australia that are suffering because they think when they get to 65 years of age, and naturally your hearing does start to fade away, where, you know, as you get older, through a number of reasons. But it doesn't mean that you have to be able to never be able to hear again or be in a situation where you're in a room and 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 what i've noticed and 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 what i've read about too is that so many adults now when they they ask the question sorry what was that and then they get embarrassed and they have to repeat the question again and they ask again and then eventually what happens is because they can't hear or they can't hear as good as they used to when they were probably my age in their 40s they then pull back and then they stop going out with their friends they stop associating um, you know, they stop participating in things. All of a sudden, depression sets in. So it's not just hearing loss, it's all the, the rest of the factors in their life. So we want to make sure that any age, and I've seen there's a lady in Cambridge, um, Pamela, she was about 83, 84 years of age, and she had the implant done through cochlea. And the first thing that she said to me, um, she says, even though I'm a POM, I can hear your Aussie accent. You might at the moment sound like Mickey Mouse because I've just had the switch on, but that will improve. And from all reports is that her hearing is back to normal and she was very, very cheeky. Um, but just great to be able to see her after a number of years going in silence. So the, the hardest thing is that, you know, when we talk about health, we talk about uh, physical health. Everyone is trying to work on their physical appearance and their health. We talk about mental health. There's a lot of different... Um, things that they're there to, to assist. But when we talk about hearing health, no one really focuses on hearing health. We, we know when there's a person that is suffering from, you know, if, if they're blind, because you can generally see they've got a, a walking stick, they might have, you know, a, um, a guide dog there to assist them. And every single um, disability is, is very, very important. But you can't see if someone's suffering from hearing loss. And until they put their hand up or until they're discovered, that's where we find out about it. So early intervention, as we say, going back to when the kids are born. Um, I've, I've seen so many children around India that have had the implant done at the age of one or two, and you see them when they're 14, 15 years of age, and you wouldn't even know. Mm -hmm. And I'm told I've got to meet Rahul. And I'm looking for Rahul, and he's standing next to me saying, oh, talking cricket. And I'm saying, yeah, I'm going to meet Rahul. Oh, you're Rahul. Didn't even realise that he had the implant done. He had a, a Kenzo in, so I couldn't even tell. Normal kid. Yeah. Every kid's normal. We often hear too that the media, not necessarily here in Australia, thank God, but over in India, the subcontinent, they say they're, they're deaf and they're dumb. Mm. And I, I, I honestly take offence to that because no kid is dumb. They haven't had the opportunity to learn. So we don't change that stigma as well. Um, but we're doing so many wonderful things around the world. And this report has got to shed so much light. And I hope the funding gets put forward. I hope that people understand March 3 is always a very important day on my calendar because I know it's World Hearing Day and it's, it's I guess, our chance as humans to give back to people that should have the, the rights that we have. Yeah, fantastic. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? We, we certainly need to have that life course perspective um, mm. all the way from babies through to older adults. Um, final question for you. You're sporting a lovely T-shirt there. If you could just briefly turn around and we can see pirouette. the Hearing Care for All <laughs> screen rehabilitation. wasn't very good on the catwalk, thank but thank you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so what does this mean for you and uh, why did you agree to become a World Health Organization World Hearing Forum champion? Look, I think that, I guess, and... I always struggle with the, the word profile. Um, I don't like to use the word celebrity. I'm, I'm a guy from Mount Warrigal that happened to be decent at playing mm -hmm. sport. And I always, look, I, I would rather be a rock star than I guess a cricketer, but I was better at cricket. <laughs> I want to get that very, very clear. But cricket to me has obviously played a huge part of my life. This is my chance, I guess, in Australia and, and certainly over in India where 
you are looked upon as differently when you play sport. And certainly, as I mentioned over in India, if you're an Australian or a past Australian cricketer, you're looked upon as being, you know, a bit special. Mm-hmm. I want to use that profile to be able to assist people and to, to raise awareness, not to get a good place at a hotel, restaurant booking or whatever it might be, to raise awareness to actually educate people um, and together make a change. So, look, this is, this is very close to my heart. I'll wear this the whole day. I'm excited about it. I think we've only just scratched the surface, though. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, Kelvin, that was a beautiful story that, that you shared about your daughter who was two. And I guess we're very similar. We've both been through that worried as a parent and, and just want the best for our children. So um, my, my child, who is now 14, living a beautiful, normal, happy life, I want to make sure that every kid and every adult will have that same opportunity. Great. And Brett, can we share who some of the other WHO World Hearing Forum champions are? There are a few around, <laughs> um, a couple of musos, which I'm, you know, we talk about Sting, Brian Adams. So, yeah, you know, absolutely. and there, there are so many, so many people, um, even with a profile that have helped out, but also to very, very down to earth, normal, everyday people, um, which is as important, I think, because it's not always about the, the superstars or someone that have achieved something in a certain area. But, um, you know, there are so many people behind the scenes. To me, everyone here has had a, an experience to help. And I always bring it back to sport, which is what I know best. And with a cricket team, you need a captain. You need your all-rounders. So a captain might be the surgeon. Mm -hmm. The all-rounder might be the clinicians and the people who are the speech therapists. Your bowlers might be the sort of, um, you know, the people doing the follow-ups and and, 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 and different parts of, you know, parts of doctors and all that type of stuff as well. But look, it's it's an organisation that, um, in terms of sport, in terms of the, the whole structure, everyone needs to be on the same team. And that's, that's what sport does, and that's what obviously with Hearing Health, if we're on the same team and, and making a difference, it's definitely going to help people. Great analogy, and that's why we're here today. Thank you very much, Brett Lee. I Pleasure. know you're a busy guy, and on behalf of um, all of our partners in Hearing Health, thank you so much for coming. Thanks very much. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so my, I would n- now like to uh, welcome the Honourable Matt Thistlethwaite, um, MP, who is a member for Kingsford S- uh, Smith, New South Wales, to speak on behalf of the federal opposition. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Can I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to elders past and present? And thank you, Zach, for your wonderful welcome to country. I acknowledge all of the distinguished guests and previous speakers that are here with us, my parliamentary colleagues, Trent and Fiona. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Mike Freelander, who's the co-chair of the Parliamentary Friends Group. Mike uh, couldn't be here today. He's on parliamentary duties uh, interstate, but he did wish me to pass on his kind regards And thanks to the organisers of this very important forum for highlighting the importance of stronger action and early intervention when it comes to hearing loss. Sophie is a young girl that uh, swims with my 10-year-old daughter. Um, They've been swimming since they were four or five years old together. Um, Sophie suffers from profound hearing loss. But if you ask the other kids that she'd swim with, she swims with and has swum with for a very long time, they'd never know. In fact, I never knew that Sophie had hearing loss until when I first met her and she took off her swim cap and I saw the cochlear implants that she was wearing. Sophie's education, her social development is equivalent to all of the other kids that she swims with. She's part of the team. Sophie benefited from two things. The wonderful technology, Australian technology developed by cochlear and early intervention services. But unfortunately, I think if you look at world statistics, Sophie is the exception. She's not the rule. The World Health Organization estimates that 466 million people suffer from hearing loss. And when I saw that statistics when I was researching this speech today, I thought that can't be right. It couldn't be 466 million people, but it is. They are official statistics. And the shocking thing is that two thirds of those people, um, that hearing loss is preventable with early intervention services and with a decent public health care system. 
And I think that's what's crucial for us here in Australia and why forums like this are so important. Because I often think about Sophie and what her life would be like if she happened to live in Papua New Guinea or the Solomon Islands or indeed in a remote Aboriginal community in Australia. She may not have the same opportunity at an education, opportunity to employment later down the track and quality of life simply because the access to those early intervention services and public health care isn't the same in other countries. Uh, Australia is a very wealthy nation. We have very high living standards, but we live in one of the poorest regions of anywhere in the world, in the Pacific. The Pacific countries uh, are traditionally and constantly don't meet their Millennium Health Goals, don't meet their goals around health outcomes, particularly around public health outcomes. And I think it's incumbent upon us to realise this, that we do live in one of the poorest nations, uh, poorest uh, regions throughout the world, and make sure in forums such as this that we're thinking about how we as a nation can assist those other nations around issues such as hearing loss and blindness and preventable diseases that can give those kids in those nations the same chances that Sophie's had in her development and being part of the team in here in Australia. So thank you to everyone for bringing us all together today and to highlighting the importance of hearing for all. And I think that's the key that's coming out of today's forum, hearing for all. And let's work together, not only in a parliamentary sense, but an Australian sense to make sure that we can try and achieve that outcome as quickly as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would now like to invite the Honourable Dr Fiona Martin. Uh, so uh, Dr Martin is the co-chair of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Friends of Hearing, Health and Deafness. Thank you. Well, I would like to uh, begin by acknowledging um, the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and um, pay my respects to Elders uh, past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge our servicemen and women who sacrifice their lives every day for our freedom. And because I'm at Macquarie University and because I had a formal life as a researcher and as an academic, I'd like to pay my respects to the academics in the room, the researchers in the room, the clinicians in the room, who, who without them, uh, this work would not be done. Without them, we wouldn't know the incidence or prevalence of hearing loss. Without them, we wouldn't have the innovation, the research, the help, the services, the screening, the early intervention, the preventative strategies in place. So thank you to all the academics and researchers and clinicians here today. On World Hearing Day, we raise awareness on how to prevent deafness and hearing loss and promote ear and hearing care access across the world. And it is fitting that this year's theme is hearing care for all, screen, rehabilitate and communicate. Screening is incredibly important and uh, as an educational and developmental psychologist, who's worked um, intensively with young children for many, many years, particularly in the area of developmental disorders, uh, have done a significant number of assessments for children with autism spectrum disorder. I can tell you that on so many occasions, children would present to me with difficulties with hearing. And so, so many times I would have to send them back um, to, to go and get a comprehensive assessment for hearing. So it's incredibly important that we're screening um, and, we're, and we're doing that process. Also, as a mother of four children, I can tell you how important, how powerful it is for young children, young babies to have that screening test now, newborn screening test in our hospitals and how powerful and important that is to getting onto hearing problems early um, and quickly and addressing them as quickly as possible to prevent um, difficulties in, in childhood, be that with learning um, or be that um, with socialising, connecting and to prevent some of the associated factors that we see 
in, in young people who, have, who experience hearing loss and including mental health problems. The ability to hear and communicate easily is something many of us take for granted. And sadly, as Matt had mentioned, 466 million people worldwide have disabling hearing loss and 34 million of these are children. Over the next three decades, it is estimated that over 900 million people will have disabling hearing loss. One of the main impacts of hearing loss is on an individual's ability to communicate with others. That exclusion from communication can have a significant impact on everyday life. Buying something at the shops, participating in school, um, you know, employment, uh, in all aspects of, of life. So it's very important that we get in early and address these problems from babies, but right through to adults. Timely action is needed in order to prevent hearing loss across the lifespan. And fortunately, hearing loss and related diseases can be avoided through preventative actions. In fact, 60% of childhood hearing loss is due to preventative causes. The Australian Government has made a major investment into improving the hearing sector. The 2020-21 budget included $589.45 million to the Hearing Services Program. And this includes over $80 million for Hearing Australia to deliver the community services stream of the Hearing Services Program which supports young Australians from birth to 26 years of age. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, of course, as well. There is much more to be done in this space, and I know that I'm working closely with Dave and, and also my parliamentary colleagues, Mike, Mike Freelander um, and Trent Zinnemann, and I look forward to working with all of you in this space to improve the hearing loss, not only of uh, Australians, and especially our, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but people across the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Martin. We are running a little over time, so I'd like to thank the Honourable Trent Zimmerman for attending today. I would, sorry, I'm sorry, Dr. Martin, I will actually like to, I'd like to invite you and uh, the Honourable Matt Thistlethwaite back up to the stage, because David Brady and I have a present to provide you. It's a copy of the uh, first ever World Report on Hearing, so we'll just take some photos. Thank you. Um, we Thank you. We will. <laughs> this lady is like reading a whole, I think, 272 pages. Uh, we have an executive copy that we'll also provide you as well, the, uh, the uh, abridged version. Um, we will be providing copies of the World Report on Hearing uh, to each of your colleagues uh, in the coming days. But we would ask if you can do what you can to draw attention to the key messages of the World Report. That would be um, much appreciated to the ministers and shadow ministers and party leaders. Um, to end, I would uh, like to reinforce why hearing care for all is so important. So we have a, a short video that we've prepared earlier that we would like to show now. Thank you. Happy World Hearing Day. Hearing is caring. Yes, hearing his needs means we care. Greetings from Waramai country in Australia. Uh, every year, every opportunity, every child. Let's get this equity right in hearing. Happy World Hearing Day. Hearing is important to me now and the future. I need help and support from my therapists and their teams so I can achieve all the things I want to do in life. Hearing care is for all and everyone to help support the importance of happy ears for early years. Good hearing and communication are important at all stages of supply. Hearing means another form of connection to the hearing world. I can have my sound on. I can have my sound off. 
but it's really important to have my sound on so I can hear. Hearing allows me not to feel isolated, but to be able to communicate and interact with others without barriers. Good person-centred hearing care lets me do this. Hearing impairment is not just a sensory impairment, it affects general well-being for all. Hearing care for all, every day, anywhere in Australia, that is at the heart of what we do. Casey here reporting on Larrakia Country, every single type of hearing loss matters and everybody deserves the right to hear and not be disadvantaged in life. Australia's hearing healthcare system falls short for adults and for our First Nations people. A simple solution is to put hearing checks into standard health checks to ensure early detection and treatment if needed. Good hearing and communication are important in all stages of our lives. Make sure if you know someone or if you are suffering from hearing loss, go and see a health professional. We support a world where no child experiences hearing loss due to preventable causes and those with hearing loss are able to achieve their full potential. The first step in identifying and treating hearing loss is screening and technology is leading the way in making it accessible to all. We need hearing screening and treatment options for all people, children and adults. Problems in hearing and auditory processing get in the way of learning which affects a child's whole life. We need easy tests to find the problems early. High quality data is needed to inform hearing health care policy and practice. Hearing care for all to help people with hearing loss through research and innovation. Hearing care is imperative for overall well-being. You're never too young or too old to get your hearing checked. Don't wait. Make the call and get your hearing checked today. Heal well, live well. I support the World Health Organization's call to action. Hearing care for all. Scream, rehabilitate, communicate. It's time to look beyond ears and enable all people with hearing loss to reach their potential in life. The fact that the World Health Organization is recognizing hearing loss and particularly the value of cochlear implants is really opening up a new era. Let's have a true conversation about hearing loss and ear diseases around the world. Hearing care for all. Because everyone deserves the very best hearing health care at every stage of life. You can see that we are all in this together. The, uh, I would like to just uh, it, to end today by thanking the Australian Hearing Hub and Macquarie University for hosting today's event. Uh, thank Michelle Halliday, Bradley Reporting for captioning. Thanks to David McQuiggan, Sweeney Interpreting for the Auslan Interpreting. And thank you to everyone for showing your support for um, the Australian la launch of the World Report on Hearing. I now invite you to join us for something to eat out in the foyer. Thank you.